Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest webinar from Zoe on COVID-19 and diet. Does what you eat matter? Today, we look at the latest research from Zoe, King's College London, and Harvard Medical School, which looks at how diet impacts COVID-19. And this is actually an area of intense interest for us because uh, scientists uh, really across the board, uh, in, in, including Zoe, are really into this subject, and I am, as, as you know. And many of you will know us for the, for the COVID study, but Zoe started out focused on nutrition research. And it's because of our broad expertise in nutrition, data science, and machine learning, that the idea to look into data quality and COVID impact uh, came about. Now, I'm Tim Spector, the lead scientist on the Zoe COVID study and also professor of ep epidemiology at King's College in London. And today I'm joined by my colleague, Sarah Berry, who is a reader in nutritional sciences at King's College London and the lead nutritional scientists at Zoe. Say hello, Sarah. Hi, and, and next we have uh, Professor Andrew Chan, uh, who is a gastroenterologist and director of epidemiology at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital and professor at Harvard. Say hi, Andy. Hi, everybody. And last but not least, Emily Leeming, who is a registered dietitian and a nutrition research consultant for Zoe. And she's just completing her PhD in this topic. Say hi, Emily. Hi, everyone. So thanks to everyone who's been contributing their questions and we're looking forward to getting some answers and discussing uh, this great topic of COVID and diet. And we'll be unpacking the latest scientific paper from Zoe, Harvard and King's researchers, uh, which uh, is gonna be coming out soon, but we'll give you a little uh, preview of it, analyzing the responses in the Zoe COVID study app explain what we mean by diet quality and discuss ways of improving that so you can be healthier, more resilient to COVID-19 and other diseases. But to kick off, as before, um, what do we mean when we talk about diet? Silly question, but Emily, uh, help us out here. So um, that's a great question. So I think when we talk about diet in terms of research, um, we really mean um, the summer food, the whole food that you might eat um, day to day versus perhaps what we talk about with friends and family, which is where we talk about diet as being perhaps, you know, a weight loss diet or a specific diet that we're doing in terms um, for health. So really here, we're really talking about what is your habitual diet? So what do you eat day to day? Great, thanks. And we'll come back to this in more detail. But um, so let's move on to our first topic, which is um, about our, the findings from the study about uh, healthy diet and our chances of catching COVID. Let's get into the nitty gritty of the research. Um, and Sarah, you've been leading the research on diet and, and, and COVID risk. Uh, tell us a little bit about how the study uh, was conducted. Uh, thanks, Tim. So this was a diet um, and lifestyle questionnaire that was implemented into the COVID symptom study app. And it was asked uh, to people to complete pre-pandemic for the month of February in the UK and the US and post-pandemic between August and September in the UK and US. And it consisted of three key elements. It consisted of a diet quality questionnaire. It consisted of a diet habits questionnaire and a lifestyle questionnaire. Diet quality basically measures what we eat, so the food that we're eating. Dietary habits measures how we're eating, so time of day, snacking, eating windows, those sorts of things. And then the lifestyle measured factors that we know are really important when we're thinking about the diet. So these might be things like physical activity um, or, or, or supplement use as well. And this was asked of all of our users, and we were really fortunate that we had 1.1 million people respond to this questionnaire. And so this makes it the world's largest ever dietary database, which is really exciting. And then what we could do with this is we could use this data 
to generate some diet quality scores. And so these are scores that are generated from the questions that we asked about what people are eating so that we could look at the quality of people's diets. So we could look at whether they had a poor, moderate or very high quality diet. And then using this data, we looked at how the quality of their diet was associated with their risk of having COVID and also the severity of their COVID symptoms. That's great. So um, let's hand over to Andy now and, and, and you can tell us a brief summarize of what the research found and why it's uh, of such great interest. Yeah, so this was really a, a, a landmark study in many ways because so many of the patients that we see ask this question, what is it that I can eat that will really affect my risk of COVID-19? Because I think we've all struggled with you know, what is it I can do personally to really minimize my individual chance of getting COVID? So when we did this study, that was really the, the question we wanted to tackle. And we found that people with the highest quality diet, i.e. those that ate the, the most uh, healthy plant-based diet, uh, diet foods, were about 10% less likely to develop COVID-19 compared with those that had the worst quality diet. And even more impressively, though they were 40% less likely to uh, get severe COVID-19 disease and go to the hospital with COVID-19. And we were also, because of all the information on the app, able to show that COVID-19 and diet, that relationship was independent of other risk factors uh, for COVID-19, including your age or your weight, your race, ethnicity, other underlying health conditions. Uh, but interestingly, we did find that there was more of an effect in people in low-income neighborhoods. So individuals that lived in low-income neighborhoods and with the lowest quality diet had about a 25% higher risk of COVID-19 than people who lived in more affluent communities who were eating the exact same diet. So I think this helps to kind of also underscore the disparities that we see in COVID-19 across both the US and the UK may also be related to the type of diets that people are eating in their individual communities and what sort of access they have to high quality foods. Yeah, that's, that's uh, fascinating. And so Sarah, what, what, what surprised you or not surprised you about those results? What do you think is the most, um, the, what was your big takeaway from, from this? I think a key finding from this is related to your chances of having COVID. So, you know, it, it stands to reason based on what we know about nutrients and foods that the higher quality diet might reduce your severity of COVID. But this is the first study ever to show that it actually reduces your chances of, of having COVID. And I think that the level of the change in risk as well, considering that we adjusted for all of these other dietary related factors as well, it is really quite uh, prominent. Um, Emily, any for you, how do you explain the, this link with uh, deprived neighbourhoods and, uh, and diet? Well, I think we, um, so low socioeconomic um, groups, so kind of lower income neighbourhoods um, tend to um, kind of be a demographic where they're really linked with um, disease, uh, high disease states, there's stress involved, you know, if you think perhaps um, in real terms that people are struggling perhaps to um, uh, pay for enough good quality food. Um, there's many different aspects of the stress, you know, probably housing insecurity, job insecurity. Um, so it's a really uh, important thing to consider in a study um, that a lot of effects could be kind of mediated by um, socioeconomic um, status. And Andy, I mean, we've, we've published several papers in the UK and the US about um, deprivation and uh, this, this, these social impacts. Do you think some of those data showing that deprivation was an independent risk factor on COVID, some of that might be due to this whole question of diet? Absolutely. I think we know that social determinants of health are critical for the development of chronic disease and COVID is a prime example. I think the inequities and in who gets COVID in both the US and the UK have really laid bare the importance of social determinants of health in you know, whether someone will develop an illness. And I think our study really for the first time shows that those social determinants are in part mediated by people's access to high quality foods. 
And so it stands to reason that when we think about trying to alleviate disparities in health outcomes, we should also be thinking about how is it that we can improve people's diet, particularly in areas that are socioeconomically deprived or areas where there are significant racial ethnic disparities. Yeah, and I think for me, the takeaway is that actually so few studies actually look at diet because this area is so underfunded uh, and no one's really looking at nutrition that we've used these other surrogates like uh, obesity or um, uh, deprivation without actually studying the diet because it's such much, much harder to do, but they are all correlated. Um, okay, um, now we've got a related question here for you, Sarah, from another Sarah Earl. Uh, what's the evidence that a well-balanced vegan or vegetarian diet affects COVID positively or negatively in terms of impact on recovery? And um, uh, this probably stems from a, a recent study, uh, a small cross-sectional study that came out uh, recently that got a little bit of press. Talk us through this. Yes, yeah, so I think this ties in with our work as well. So there's a study that we can touch on if you want in more detail a bit later, if we have time, that was published recently uh, last week, looking at the effects of different types of diets, so different dietary patterns. So whether someone's on a keto diet or a plant-based diet and looking at how they looked at how that was associated with people's severity once they had COVID. And what they found in that research is that people that were following a plant-based diet had a lower um, severity of COVID. What we've also found with our research, um, as Sandy said, that it also minimizes your chances of getting COVID if you're following a plant-based diet. And the reason we know this is the very specific score that we used in um, our research was the HPDI score, which is the Healthy Plant Dietary Index Score. And this is a score that was developed quite recently by the group at Harvard which looks at the quality of plant-based foods in someone's diet. So it's a plant-based dietary score, but specifically looking at healthy sources of plant-based diet, diets. We know that foods and diets, you know, it's so diverse and that just because it's plant-based doesn't mean it's necessarily healthy. But this score allowed us to look at the quality and the plant-based source of these foods. And what we found was that using this HPDI, this is where we saw this reduction in risk and this reduction in severity as well. And I think something that um, I would have liked to have picked up on earlier and forgot to mention was that something that's really interesting from this work is we saw what we call a nonlinear relationship with diet quality. So what we saw is up to a certain level, we saw a favorable impact of improving your diet quality on your chance of getting COVID and your severity of COVID. But once you reached a certain level of healthiness, then it plateaued, it kind of leveled out. So I think a really important message to people is here is yes, we should all be trying to improve our diet, but it doesn't mean you have to go wild. You don't have to go crazy and deny yourself of everything. As long as we're in, including, you know, as much plant-based healthy on processed foods as possible, that's enough to be able to get to the level at which we see this plateauing. That's great. And I think the key also in this question is, is the world is well-balanced vegan or vegetarian diet, because there are still some uh, very unhealthy vegan and vegetarian diets. And so ones that have a diversity of plants uh, is really, and, you know, a range of foods is really important in that. Um, Andy, I've got a tough one for you here from Jan uh, on, on Slido. What's more important in terms of COVID? Is it your diet or your weight? That's an excellent question. I think, you know, so much research has already shown that being overweight or obese does increase your risk of both developing COVID and you know, having more severe disease. And it's an important public health message. You know, certainly we need to acknowledge that is a significant risk factor. But a lot of people look at that data and wonder, what is it that uh, does it mean for me? If I already happen to be overweight, you know, does this mean I'm destined to kind of have, you know, a, a, a higher risk or have a more severe course. And it kind of creates a situation where people don't really know what to do with that information on an individual level. So we really wanted to know, is there something else that we could do to really modify our risk? And so we look carefully at the association of diet among people with various body weights. And in our study, we actually found that even if you were overweight or obese, if you had a high quality diet, you still had a lower risk of developing COVID-19. So I think that's a critical public health message. There is something modifiable that we can do to improve our chances of getting through this pandemic. And that is, you know, really think and pay attention to diet quality. 
And this is something that I think is independent of weight. So in many ways, I think we can really think about diet as being a more critical factor in some ways than being overweight or obese. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's somewhat analogous to the, 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 the epidemiology that being overweight or obese can be mitigated if you just take some exercise. So even if you don't change your weight, it still has a, a bigger, bigger effect. So I think that um, brings us nicely onto our second theme really, which is um, what do we mean by diet quality uh, and, and how does it work? Um, so we all work in various areas of nutrition. Um, so let's try and uh, get a bit of definition on about what, what we're thinking about about diet quality. Um, Emily, diet quality and gut-friendly diets. Give us a, a starter here. Yes, okay. So let's start with diet quality. Um, so diet quality is a spectrum. I think Sarah kind of touched on this earlier. Um, so if you have a high quality diet, usually we're alluding to um, a diet that is diverse, it's well balanced, you know, it's providing you with enough energy and nutrients um, to really lead a kind of active, full, uh, fulfilled life. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, if you have a low quality diet, um, typically we think that's kind of uh, foods that are associated or a pattern of foods um, that are associated with a kind of poorer potential risk of, of health outcomes. Um, so things like potentially ultra processed foods, um, low intake of fruits and vegetables and whole grains, you know, those things that we really know really help to support your health. Um, and then if we talk about uh, gut friendly diets, um, I think quite often the first thing that comes to mind is that we're talking about potentially food intolerances or um, kind of digestive issues. But really what we mean when gut friendly diets is, and this could still play a role, um, is that we're talking about the gut microbiome. So this is a collection of bacteria that live in your colon, so your lower intestine. And we've had a phenomenal amount of research in the last 10 years to come out to show that these bacteria play a fascinating role in our health, whether it's um, our metabolic health, lung, heart, you know, there's a brain gut communication pathway. Um, so it's a very exciting uh, up and coming area. And we really talk about your gut microbiome as being your second brain. So when we talk about gut friendly diets, the biggest thing that, you know, it's in your intestine, these, these collection of, of bugs, is that we need to feed them. So we're talking about foods um, that support your gut microbiome to flourish you know, get really diverse number of bacteria based on a di diverse um, amount of foods. And I think we'll probably talk a bit more about specifically what a gut microbiome diet is a bit later. And, and just briefly, do you think a high, high diet, a high quality diet is, is virtually always gut friendly? Yes, I think, yeah, I think you're, 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 you're bang on with that. Because I think really it's, it's those fruits and vegetables, whole grains, um, you know, oily fish, um, getting those omega-3s, uh, fermented foods, really all those things that, that we already kind of have awareness and know about, um, you know, almost this Mediterranean style um, of eating. Um, so it's just almost bringing another piece of the puzzle in to understand why this is helping us with our health. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so Andy, uh, there haven't been many studies relative on diet quality, um, I guess that means it's quite hard to measure, but how, how do you go about measuring diet quality in, in these sort of huge studies like these? It's a great question. I think, um, you know, that's one of the um, really important tools that we've developed in the last uh, several years to really identify these important relationships between diet and, and chronic diseases like COVID. Uh, so some of my colleagues at Harvard have really been pioneers in developing uh, food frequency questionnaires and other surveys that can be used to actually assess diet quality in large populations, which we adapted for this study. And they've shown that these, you know, uh, surveys are, can be validated to really uh, identify what is a high quality diet compared to a low quality diet. So it becomes a very useful measure in a population of individuals. And in turn, that provides the opportunity to actually translate these surveys and scores into things that are actionable on a public health level. So diet quality is now, I think, something that we can get a better handle on. And I think that's really allowed us to progress in the research that we've done with this COVID study, but also other areas of chronic disease. 
And do you think um, we one day replace this and just say, you know, what's your ultra processed food score? And that will do the, have to do the same. What's your feeling on that? Well, I think that what the research has shown with these types of, of surveys and diet quality studies is that it isn't enough to just eat more and more of one micronutrient or eat more and more of one type of food. It really comes down to patterns of food and, pat and patterns of eating. And so I think we're going to need to have a, the ability to assess dietary patterns. And some of that will involve you know, development of various scores. And I think uh, you know, a scoring system that indicates you know, how, how high quality your diet will be is probably going to be the most actionable step people can take to really you know, use diet to improve their long-term health. Mm. Um, Sarah, um, just to bring you in on this, do you, do you think in the future we'll be having a, a you just rather than diet quality, we, we, we might go for something about you know, how much ultra processed food do you have in a week? Or is it possible to have high levels of ultra processed food and still have a healthy diet? Good question. Um, no, in simple words, uh, I don't think it's possible to have um, ultra processed and high quality. I think it's possible to uh, consume moderately processed foods in a high quality diet. And I think there's a lot of confusion around the term food processing, many things that are processed um, and still considered by many people in their natural form. But I think where we see the harm, as you say, and Andrew said, is in the ultra processed foods. Whether it's as simple as that we could just do an ultra processed score to look at, at um, you know, allocating kind of quality of a diet, I, I don't know. But I think that we're very likely to see that the more ultra processed, the higher the score, the higher the ultra processed score, the worse health outcomes that we have. It's interesting because I. I recent statistic I had was 50% of our calories in the UK come from ultra processed foods yeah. and 60% in the US. And so we're like, you know, the two leading countries in the world in this, uh, on this rather bad competition, uh, which, yeah, I mean, it, be, it's, it, it, sorry, Tim. which could be one reason why, you know, we've done so badly with COVID and, uh, you know, the, the fatality rate is quite so bad in, in these countries that have this uh, high level of um, processing the food as, as, as the norm, you know, so that it's rare for people who don't have much of it. Yeah. Definitely. And I think uh, one of the big problems with the, the processing of the food is you're taking the food out of its original matrix. So uh, out of its original structure, you're losing a really important component that confers health benefits of food, which is actually the structure of food. We often talk just about nutrients and we rarely talk about the structure of the food. And this is really important. And by removing that structure from the food, we know that people tend to eat a higher energy. So they consume more calories at a given sitting. They eat faster. And also, as well as removing the structure of the food, it also in that process removes many of what we call the non-nutritive bioactives. And these are many of the beneficial compounds that are in foods that we often don't talk about. So these aren't the carbohydrates, the proteins, the fiber, the fat. These are, are chemicals such as uh, polyphenols or nitrates, for example, that have really favorable health effects. And this is what's really lacking in these ultra processed foods. And when we talk about ultra processed foods, just to give an idea of the kind of foods that we mean, we mean um, some breakfast cereals, for example, we would mean uh, chocolate, Coca-Cola, all of these things that we might go and grab as a quick, easy, accessible snack. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so, I, I mean, is bread an ultra-processed food? Bread is, if it's, um, it's considered, well, there's a classification system called the NOVA classification system, um, which is what we use in research at the moment, and that classifies bread that is uh, bought from a shop to be ultra processed, but if it's homemade, then it's moderately processed. Um, but I do think, I think one of the things we have to remember with these, so there's a really interesting um, study from Lancet, which looked at multinational and they looked at disease risk and kind of risk of, of dying. And it was the, the factors in diets that were most strongly um, kind of related to mitigating those risks, so reducing those risks were uh, vegetable and whole grain intake and reduced sodium. 
So I feel like that says a lot to me um, in terms of public health, health message that while we need to be careful about, you know, these ultra processed foods, what we really need to be focusing on is just increasing those fruits and vegetables in case, like what are the positive things that we can do? Because doing that will naturally crowd out those things that are possibly less nutrient dense. Um, so that's how I kind of... Yeah, it, I think that's right. The general rule, if you fill your plate with enough plants, you can have the odd uh, bit of extra rubbish every now and again, it doesn't matter so much. Um, uh, before we move on to the gut microbiome, just there was a quick another question here for you, uh, Sarah, on um, what's the evidence that carb, carb levels of an individual diet might affect your risk of infection and complications with COVID-19? And this comes really from the, this idea of, you know, is a macro, are, are all carbs bad? You know, should we be on um, high fat, low carb diets, I guess? Yeah, so I, I to, to address the main point here is there is no evidence yet. So the work that we've done and the, the paper that was published last week looked at foods and looked at food groups and looked at dietary scores. Um, there is evidence to show that carbohydrate rich foods have an unfavorable effect on our inflammatory response and they impact pathways involved in, what, in cytokine production and cytokines are particular messengers involved in our inflammatory response. And we know that this is related to the severity of COVID. But like you said, Tim, you know, we're really moving beyond looking at single nutrients and we're really starting to understand that, you know, as we consume food and food within it's this uh, very complex matrix that I mentioned earlier, so complex structure, has a, a big effect on modulating uh, how nutrients impact our health. So what we need to be thinking about is the foods that we're eating, the dietary patterns that we're consuming and not single nutrients. And something that's really important, and this picks up on what a point Emily just said, that when we add something to our diet, we're removing something else. So you said, Tim, that as long as you've got plenty of plant-based foods in there, it's, it's okay having some of these other foods or even some of these less healthy foods. It's once you start taking out the healthy foods and replacing them with less healthy foods. And so when we think about what we eat and how we change our diet, we've got to think about what are we replacing and what are we displacing? And I think that's a really important point um, you know, to think about. All right, so, so you wouldn't advise someone in order to go on a keto diet in order to prevent them getting COVID-19? Um, I think there's absolutely no evidence to support that. And I think, again, the whole premise of keto diets around nutrients, you can have a keto diet that can still be healthy, just like you can have a high carb diet that can still be healthy um, as well. But in the same thread that we talked about earlier, you know, even saying a plant-based diet is healthy, the quality of the plants within that plant-based diet is really important. Okay, so the take-home message is there. Let's look at the individual items and look at the health and quality of them. Let's not get obsessed with macronutrients like carbs and fats and things like that, because there's good and bad ones of them all. Great. Absolutely. Um, um, let's move on to the gut microbiome. Um, and Andy, you're going to tell us uh, what it is and how important it is. Yeah, I think Emily touched on this a little bit before. You know, the gut microbiome is that community of microorganisms, i.e. bacteria, that live in our gut in a normal state of, of being. So they sort of live in harmony with our, our, uh, our bodies. Uh, and it's been clear that this community of bacteria interacts with our bodies so that it actually does have a function in terms of either promoting or, or, or causing health issues. And we know that a lot of our immunity or our immune system is based on this gut collection of gut bacteria and how it interacts with our bodies. Uh, so much of our immune function and much of how we sort of uh, are able to protect ourselves against diseases uh, is reliant on what kind of bacteria live in our gut. So we've learned with uh, research done in many different areas that really trying to boost your gut microbiome in a positive way is actually a critical way to actually improve your overall health and that can be done in several ways. One uh, really important way, and I think one way that's been uh, shown by the research we've done, is to use diet to actually feed the gut microbiome 
food that it actually uh, enjoys and loves and really is able to promote bacteria that are healthy. Uh, and this can take the form of, again, various types of food that we eat in our diet, but also very specific types of food. Uh, for example, fiber is known to be a dietary component which tends to actually favor the growth of bacteria that are healthy. And that's, I think, uh, important for uh, not only COVID-19, but also other diseases that we potentially feel are based on how our immune system interacts with the outside world. And that includes diseases like heart disease, cancer, autoimmune disease, et cetera. So these are all things that probably have a strong, uh, are strongly influenced by what's in our gut. Yeah, thank you. And I think there's an interesting analogy because a lot of people take um, uh, PPIs, things like omeprazole, uh, those kind of drugs which have, you know, they thought were very healthy, but they have a very tiny little effect on the acidity of, of the gut that changes the microbes a little bit. And they've shown that that actually increases your risk of infection. So that really emphasizes how just tweaking your, your gut microbes can uh, help your immunity and, and prevent infection in that way. Um, but let's get back to um, food. Um, let's just remind us really, um, either Sarah or Emily about um, gut friendly foods. Wh what do we mean by that now? And, and how can our diet affect this? So um, Sarah Fitzgerald, I'll, I'll jump in on this one. Um, uh, foods, the gut microbiome friendly foods. So really we're talking about, um, so if we think about um, our selection of bugs are living in our um, lower colon and, and in our colon. And what we're doing is that we're supplying an environment of food to these bacteria that then munch away on them and they produce um, you know, beneficial uh, chemicals such as short chain fatty acids, which then go into the body and have uh, exert, um, we hope, beneficial health um, outcomes. So really we're kind of feeding them and nourishing them uh, as best we can. Um, and things that we know uh, do this, and Andy you know, mentioned, you know, fiber is a really uh, key um, component. So we find that in plant foods, whole grains, so fruits, veg, nuts, seeds, uh, legumes are really high in fiber. Um, I know they make you fast a lot, but that tends to also be a sign um, usually of a healthy gut microbiome. Um, and then we have things like polyphenols, which are uh, the antioxidants that we find in all the amazing different colors uh, of fruits and vegetables. And these we think um, also feed the microbiome, the bugs, and they really enjoy feasting on those. Uh, other things like fermented foods, um, uh, you know, overwhelmingly popular at the moment. Uh, research has yet to catch up with um, studying uh, most of the different types of fermented foods, but we do still think, I mean, there still, you know, tends to be a fruit or vegetable that's been fermented. Um, kefir has got some really strong evidence of having um, really plentiful number of bacteria, which then come down and um, kind of add to the community that's already there. Um, so if we're talking about uh, a diet as a whole, what we're really specifically talking about um, and what's important with the gut microbiome is your long-term diet. So going for a quick fix, gut set re weekend is probably not gonna get you very far. It's really what you're providing your gut microbiome day by day. So really having those, um, you know, the oily fish with omega-3s, that fiber rich foods with fruit, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, nuts, seeds, um, as much as you can. Uh, and um, you know, fermented dairy, you know, just trying, trying, you know, within your limit, it's very much to you, don't, you don't want to feel too stressed about this. Um, but things like, um, I just see there's a question about um, baked beans. So we have to think about also the levels of processing um, that these foods have. Um, so, um, it, and, and then just kind of, uh, and factoring that in um, and potentially, you know, we want to choose things that are minimally processed. So as close to probably maybe just cooking them rather than, you know, bought off a, um, a shop floor um, that's been in a packet and it can stay there for a few weeks, if not months. Yeah, but tins of beans are still actually very good and nutritious as are frozen um, veg. So let's not... Uh, no, definitely. I think, I think you're so right. It's really expensive, I think, is the message. Uh, no, I think you think you can, um, yeah, you still... It's, it's just working with your own co with where you're at, I think. I think 
just small steps. It doesn't have to be anything um, too drastic. Okay, you may not be able to answer this, Emily, but are there any links so far between the, the gut microbiome and the severity of, uh, of a COVID infection? Um, the gut microbiome and severity, I think we've seen some research to show there's potentially some we call dysbiosis, um, which is basically kind of an imbalance of the gut bacteria in some COVID patients. Um, I think there's a still very early days and we're yet to see um, really what, more unteasing that question, but I think it'll be interesting in the future, but perhaps um, Andy or Sarah might be able to jump in on that. I do think we can extrapolate a little bit here from findings um, from uh, our wider research where we've used the same diet quality score, so we've used the same HPDI score. And we found that it's very closely associated with the microbiome, very closely associated with favorable bugs within our microbiome. And so as part of this research, we developed this diet microbiome signature where we found that this diet quality score was really closely associated with good bugs, which was really, were really closely associated with favorable health outcomes, one of which was inflammation. So we found that the HPDI through the microbiome may be associated with attenuating inflammation. And again, we know that this is important in terms of the progression of COVID and the severity of COVID. Now I am kind of jumping from uh, multiple steps here, but at this stage, we don't have any evidence regarding the actual causality, but I think via these associations, it's fair to say that it's very likely that there is going to be some sort of impact. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And we've had a question about gut microbiome tests. Um, so why is the microbiome test not available yet in the UK? Uh, and, and when it is available in the US? Um, I might as well take this one. Uh, well, it's all because of uh, COVID. You can blame COVID. Uh, the Zoe tree team dropped everything when um, COVID came along and uh, the, whole, the whole company moved towards getting the a COVID app up and up and running and that really uh, slowed us down by about six months and of course getting things done in COVID uh, is particularly difficult and that's why uh, it's taken us longer but um, uh, we are getting back on track and so uh, we, we will be having a, a, a microbiome test plus the full uh, Zoe uh, personalized nutrition package uh, in the UK before the end of the year so uh, you can go on a wait list and find out on the, on the website. Um, and that's on the, the joinzoe.com website. But um, going back to uh, food, um, Andy, are there any foods that really you think should be uh, particularly eaten or avoided if you want to avoid uh, long COVID or, or get, get recovery from it? Any evidence? That's a great question, you know, as, as I think you highlight and I think what the uh, questioner is, is referring to is this phenomenon of long COVID that we know is going to be a really critical and important question going forward given the number of people that have already been infected. I think our own research in the Zoe COVID app has shown that at least 15 if not a higher percentage of individuals who uh, develop COVID will have longer term symptoms and have sequelae or symptoms that will continue to bother them for several months. So the question is, is there something we can do to either avoid that from happening or if people are suffering from long-term symptoms, is there anything they can do to mitigate those symptoms? And diet, I think, is one of those areas which I think has a lot of potential based on the research that we've done here, but also based on other lines of evidence. And so given that we think long COVID probably has something to do with, again, our body's immune system and how it interacts with uh, the gut microbiome and our other organ systems, it stands to reason that we can probably improve the situation by trying to modulate our diet in a positive way and trying to, again, improve our gut microbiome in a positive way, which could help to mitigate some of these uh, symptoms. And that's research that we're very uh, strongly focused on, on doing and something that we'll hopefully be able to do with the COVID uh, study app. And so we're encouraging people to continue to use the app uh, because we've already collected all this diet information. If we can continue to track people long-term for long COVID, that will be uh, really vital information for the population at large. Thank you. And uh, it's sort of related to this, Emily. Um, another question is saying, okay, long time I get it, but what is there anything 
short term you can do to boost your immune system to say, you know, you suddenly think you've uh, met someone with COVID, can, can you get out there and uh, suddenly uh, change things around in a few days? Yeah, well, I think um, I think there's so many facets potentially to that. I think the first potential uh, would be, you know, your gut microbiome can, you know, fluctuate, you know, rapidly, um, you know, within a number of hours. So I think, you know, always moving towards a uh, kind of higher diet quality is going to provide you with those essential nutrients. And what we're talking about is, um, you know, those nutrients that are really important for our immune system. So things like um, carotenoids, which are found in orange colored fruits and vegetables, um, support your immune system, fat soluble, um, vitamin, things like um, vitamin D. And I think when we talk about uh, vitamins and nutrients, it's if you are deficient in those uh, and they are related to your immune system, then potentially you might have a slightly weaker or impaired immune system because you aren't getting um, those things straight away. Uh, on the other flip side, um, we do know that potentially in um, uh, respiratory illnesses, for example, your needs for things like vitamin C and zinc um, increase. So it might be, you know, that you maybe take something short term. Um, it's still very early days and knowing what the evidence is, you know, it kind of fluctuates around that. But, you know, things like vitamin D, for example, um, they uh, have studies, uh, meta-analysis showing that um, those who are taking vitamin D, uh, not with COVID related, let's talk, we're talking about respiratory illnesses, um, had a reduced uh, severity of respiratory tract infections. Um, again, same with people who are older aged um, with uh, reduced risk of getting pneumonia in another group of studies. Um, vitamin D is a sunshine vitamin. Um, we get it from the sun and we, it's an immunoregulatory hormone. So it has many different uh, effects um, in our immune system. Um, we only have a few food sources that we can get from it. So cod liver oil, I'm not sure many people don't really want to eat that. Um, but things like eggs, um, some uh, mushrooms, and we tend to be deficient in the uh, winter months in the UK because we aren't getting quite enough sunshine. Um, so the NICE guidelines uh, suggest that everybody should be taking vitamin D over the winter and for older people um, across um, the entire year. And actually, I think um, the um, I think it's Society of Immune and Nutrition um, during COVID has suggested that the older people also potentially look at their vitamin E and zinc um, and vitamin C um, intake or supplement um, during this time. Um, Okay. And I think it's, it's, it's a really interesting question. And I think, um, you know, even the you know, World Health Organization have put out um, that during COVID that we should be eating nine portions of fruit and vegetables a day, which is much higher than yeah. most dietary guidelines at, you know, okay. five portions. Just, I mean, we don't completely agree on, on the benefits of supplements, but I, I, I think we'd all agree that we should try foods first. Yeah. Uh, rather than that. And so um, that I think is the, the message there. We, we did do a big study, which we published from the, the Zoe app on that, in, that basically supplements only have a very small effect and only in women, not at all in men. So unclear if they work. So it's, my, my stick to good food first, uh, that reach for the, reach for the yogurt uh, is my, is my uh, uh, passing final word on that. Now we need to move on. Um, so, how can we improve our diet quality scores? Any, anything else we haven't discussed uh, here from, from uh, the three of you? I think we've- Tim, I think something we haven't mentioned much is oily fish. And um, oily fish is a great source of omega-3. Now you can get omega-3 from other uh, plant-based foods. But what we know is really important in terms of immune function and particularly in terms of inflammatory responses as well. So the inflammatory component of our immune response are the very long chain omega-3s. And the very long chain omega-3s are only found in oily fish. Now our body can convert a small amount of the shorter chain omega-3s that are found in plant foods into these longer chains, but we're not very good at doing that. And so whilst we encourage people to consume very plant-based foods. We do know that it's also beneficial to include oily fish in the diet. And this is something as well, that other study that was published last week showed that actually including oily fish in the diet has a favorable effect. 
and another score that we did also look at as part of the work that we did on, on uh, the COVID symptom study uh, paper that we're talking about, we also used a score that incorporated oily fish as one of the components to reflect a healthy diet. And again, we saw that that was associated with reduced risk of having COVID and reduced risk of severity. And this is because that very long chain omega-3 that you have in oily fish has really special properties in terms of the chemicals it releases and the way that it interacts with both our immune and our inflammatory responses as well. Okay, I think we'll try and get through a few of these other, some quick, really quick answers to some of these uh, questions as we try and get more about it. So question from Simon Shaw about um, intermittent fasting uh, and the microbiome, um, and, and so any, is that, what's the evidence for this, or, or fast or restricted time eating where you're resting your gut for 14 hours a day? Do you want to take that, Andy? Yeah, as far as I know, I don't know that there's evidence related to that and COVID, uh, whether it impacts the microbiome, I think that's also still early days to really understand whether that uh, effect that they're seeing with that restricted diet um, uh, may have an effect on the microbiome. I think it, it is an um, important and open uh, scientific question, but one that I think we need to tackle in the future. Yeah, there's a lot of animal I think Tim, it, lacking, lacking human data, I think, on that. But uh, Sarah? Yeah, I mean, it's something that people are becoming really fascinated by. And I think something that we do know is it's the timing of those eating windows that's important. So whilst reducing your eating window might not have a huge effect, if you can kind of front end your food, so try and consume more foods earlier in the day than later in the day, we, there is evidence to show that that has favorable effects in terms of metabolic health. We also know that the microbiome has this circadian rhythm as well. And so it's a really exciting area that we're going to go on to explore within the Zoe studies. So it's a, a watch this space one as well. Yeah, and some people might be morning people rather than evening people. So not everyone's gonna be the same. Um, I think we've, we've touched on vitamins, so I will. Um, uh, Emily, Helen from asks, uh, we're on a carb-free eating plan with only meat, vegetables, and nuts in our diet. A um, bit of omega-3 and vitamins and minerals. Is that gonna, is that gonna beat COVID, yes or no? <laughs> Carbohydrate-free. Um, well, we don't really know what the, uh, you know, there hasn't been specific research to look at um, carbohydrate apart from, I think, what Sarah maybe mentioned as maybe uh, a study that I think was looking at, um, I think, protein and carbohydrate, but I don't think I can talk too much about that. Um, okay, I think the general principle is anything that restricts your range of plants is not generally a good idea. So uh, I, think, I think within that you can still, you know, have a healthy diet on a low carb. I think it goes back to Sarah's point about high quality diet um, is the important factor. Although, you know, I agree we shouldn't demonize carbohydrates. And well, it's I noticed the question that she got vegetables. She eats vegetables, but saying it's a carb free diet. So it, it, again, it depends on our uh, knowing what we understand by, you know, because vegetables are carbohydrates, they're just healthy ones. Um, okay, can, drinking kefir, drinking kefir, we've sort of touched on this, but perhaps just, um, I can take that one, how much per day? The key, to the, the key to all probiotic foods is small amounts regularly, because it doesn't stay hang around in your body for uh, more than a couple of days. So every couple of days, you've got to be topping up your, your microbes. I think that's, that's really important. So no point having a huge kombucha binge every month. Uh, you've got a, a small shot is what I, I'd recommend or, or, or whatever it is, whether it's your, um, any of the four Ks. Um, um, anything, any foods or drinks to recommend help with fatigue um, along COVID sufferers asking? Anyone want to take that one? I can, I can talk, talk about, I think, um, I think when you're feeling absolutely ghastly and really, really ill, you just got to really just be conscious that you can just only do what you can do. Um, and whatever, if that happens means, you know, having a slice of cake, because that's the only thing you feel like eating, then that is still providing your body with energy and nutrients. And we know in disease states or illnesses states that we do need, um, you know, a high amount of energy, a high amount of energy usually than normal to be able to fight things off. Um, in terms of trying to 
have things that are going to make you feel nourished um, that are easier to eat so things um, like soups if you can have you know if a bit shop bought perfect anything that's just quick easy you can put in the microwave for five minutes you know tim mentioned frozen um, vegetables um, you know they're picked on sauce so they're really probably potentially got higher nutrient um, value than if you know we find them on the shop floor having been in transit um, smoothies um, having some nuts on hand so you can just keep you know part of nuts in your bag in a in a jar and just take those around it's it's just thinking what works for you, what is easy, and not um, being too hard on yourself uh, in terms of um, what you're able to do. Great, okay. And um, final word from all of you. Um, uh, just to, to sum up really, um, a lot of questions about supplements here. So um, each of you just give us your, your view on, on supplements for COVID and versus diet quality for COVID. Andy? I think that the data so far on supplements have been largely disappointing. Um, and I think it's been pretty clear that there isn't a magic bullet for COVID when it comes to a pill. Uh, there is still some ongoing research that I think will be important to follow. I, I think there's still a lot of work in vitamin D and some trials on vitamin D, which we're going to be very eager to see the results of. But I think based on the work we've done here, and I think based on the, on the evidence so far, I think it's, it's clear that probably diet as a whole is more important than relying on any one particular micronutrient or supplement that you can buy at the pharmacy. Sarah, any, anything to add on that? No, I just, uh, what I would add is for nearly all health outcomes, it's becoming more and more evidence that we need to move beyond nutrients. Nutrients don't act in isolation, isolation, they act in synergy with other nutrients and with the food structure. So let's think about foods and not nutrients, and therefore let's move beyond supplements and think about the foods that we're eating to get those kind of vitamins and minerals. Great, I'll go along with that. So um, thanks to Emily, Sarah and Andy for joining uh, me today. And thanks for all of you for joining us, submitting questions and particularly those who are loyal loggers. Um, the Zoe COVID study is an essential tool we use by the government to track the pandemic. So please do keep logging and sharing it with everyone. And we mentioned a few times about uh, Zoe being involved in nutrition and we'll be sharing useful links uh, for anyone who wants to know about that. So keep an eye out for those. Remember to subscribe uh, to, to the Zoe uh, YouTube for all updates. And lastly, thank you, stay safe and keep logging. <laughs>